Hey, what's going on? Welcome to The Doug Show. My name is Doug Cunnington, and in this episode, I talk to James DeLacy. He's the host over at the Niche Website Builders Podcast. So I've been on their show, I think a couple times, and James and I talk about his background. He has a couple niche sites that he works on, and he's earning from a variety of uh, different sources. He's been dabbling with memberships. He has a podcast associated with his niche site and a couple other things as well. He's dabbled with courses. So we dive into all the details. We talk about things that have worked out well, some things that didn't work out, and things that he's testing right now. So it's a great candid conversation. Really, it's like what you would hear if James and I were having a couple drinks and just hanging out. So be sure to check out his show over the Niche Website Builders podcast. I'll put a link for that. Plus, we'll link up to all of uh, James' uh, socials and his sites and stuff like that. I think you could check some of them out. Uh, we'll we'll see. I'll, I'll double check the notes that I have from him. Before I send it to the interview, just want to give a little shout out to uh, myself. Sign up for the email list if you're not already on there. It's really over at uh, nichesiteproject.com. So I'll put a link in the description and I send you all my templates. I send you all my systems and other things that I've offered up as you know kind of freebies, those lead magnets that we do. Plus I send you a, an email uh, each week. Actually, it's, it's like one to three emails depending on what's going on. Like today, it's a Monday. Usually I do send an email on a Monday, but I sent kind of a lot of emails last week. So today I was like, I'll just let it slide and I'll, I'll resume on Wednesday, but I'll, I'll send you a couple emails. Usually I send you information about content that has uh, recently been published. So a new podcast interview comes out or a new YouTube video is out. I might mention that. And usually, you know, one of the emails per week, it's not necessarily linking to anything like that. It's just some, uh, not random thoughts, but it's thoughts or some commentary on whatever I'm interested in. Sometimes it's uh, sleep related. Sometimes it's fitness. Sometimes it's chat GPT. You know, it's been a uh, topic of conversation for the last couple months here. So just depends. Anyway, check out the email list over there. Would love to have you on board. Without further ado, let's hear from James DeLacy. Hey, what's going on? Welcome to The Doug Show. My name is Doug Cunnington. And today we're going to talk to James DeLacy, the host over at the Niche Website Builders podcast, and he has a portfolio of sites. He's been working online for a little while, and I don't know the full extent. I don't know all the background, so this is going to be like a getting to know you. We're just going to kind of shoot the shit and learn about uh, what James has going on. So James, how's it going today? All right. Thanks for having me on, Doug. Yeah, shoot the shit. My favorite type of podcast. Just sit here and chat. Awesome. Well, We've chatted a couple of times. I've been on uh, your show, mm -hmm. which actually that's kind of a good place to start. So how did you start yeah. hosting that podcast? <laughs> yeah, funnily enough. So if I take it right back, I had someone reach out to me through DM through social media. And he was like, hey, is this your site? I was ranking for a keyword that he was, I guess he was going to write for. <clears throat> and I was like, yep, that's my site. And I was like, wait, I recognize you from, so I started with the income school blogging course and have a forum and then i recognized him from the forum and then we kind of just linked up and got on chat and just connected that way and then it must have been i don't know how many months or a year later because we had just stayed in constant contact he was like hey um he knows adam and mark well they're looking for a podcast host i think you'd be great to do it i'll put i'll put you in for it if you like and i said like, okay and then got on a call with them and then basically just did it <laughs> and then i've been doing it since uh, near the beginning of 2022. So it's almost been a full year now doing Niche Website Builders podcast. Okay. And did you have experience like hosting a podcast before? Nope. I just, I've just been guests on a few different ones within my, my career um, path before that, but never hosted, just jumped straight in. Okay. Gotcha. That's, that's <laughs> pretty cool. Like uh, I, I know a lot of, a lot of brands do want to, get in front of like my podcast audience, for example, mm -hmm. but I'm pretty protective of the audience. That said, I know like they would, like those companies would want to have a podcast and they like need talent, but like, I, I, I don't think they've connected the dots yet. So this could be a route for people if like, 
you do have like broadcasting experience, you, you probably could contact companies and say, Hey, I'll, I'll do a show, like get started. Yeah, sure. And then I bet you could probably earn a, a decent amount from it. So, okay, cool. So you have a few websites and we'll, we'll kind of back into it. So tell me about your portfolio currently, and then we'll learn about how you got started working online. Okay. So I have two main sites. <clears throat> I think, uh, most of them are pretty much public, but my main one is in combat sports. I mean, sweet science of fighting.com. I think that's pretty much everywhere. So we'll, we'll, we can name that one. So that's focusing on physical preparation, strength conditioning for fighters. Then I have another one that's more in the, I acquired it September, 2021. And that's more in the general, uh, I guess, fitness space, but more focused on strength sports. So competitive, like Olympic weightlifting, strongman, um, some powerlifting, and then just general building muscle kind of stuff. So obviously a bigger scope there in terms of uh, traffic potential and things like that. And they've got a few other smaller sites, just acquired one uh, last week. And that's kind of building a, I guess you'd say building a moat around the combat sports site. So um, essentially acquiring sites just in one sport and then building those out too, to essentially promote the stuff on my own site. And so that's pretty much, I mean, I've got some older ones. Like when I first started, I've got like an old pet site, you know, how everyone starts, everyone starts on pets. Yeah. So I've got that. And that was kind of like my first foray into it with income school and made it into a Kindle ebook or Kindle book and all that shit. So that's okay. still there. Got it. And do you, do you still earn a little bit of money with that, that first site? <laughs> yeah. The, I don't know how it survives. I haven't touched it since 2020. Google still seems to like it, ranks it for stuff. I think it made like, it usually makes around 10 to 20 bucks a month from Amazon. But last month, I think it made like 40 bucks or some shit. I don't know how, but it sits there. It just pays for itself. And maybe uh, maybe if I have more time one day or have like the resources, I might get someone to just throw in a whole lot of posts on it and then just monetize it with ads and sell it. But I just don't have the time right now. Gotcha. <laughs> so is that when you first got started like that literally that was your first site yeah 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 so i guess you could say i had so if i take it i know we're going to go back to the background so when i actually let's let's go way way back so before this so i was working in professional sport as a strength conditioning coach professional rugby and rugby league and i've been since going through that as one thing that coaches do is they'll write for other websites but without any seo or any of that kind of stuff in mind it's more like Hey, I'm going to share this on these sites because one, it helps them just become more well known within the coaching space, and two, it helps them you spread them, like give good information, and then you know that's how you build credibility as a coach as well, and kind of network and things like that. So, I've been writing for a few different, uh, I guess, of the bigger sports science and and fitness style websites. I mean, one of the like some of the most well known ones would be like T Nation, um, Stack Magazine, and then there's some. Um, other ones, science for sport, I've been kind of freelancing for for about five, over five years now. And so I had been writing for those sites, but without SEO in mind. And then I had, I guess my first, my first site was for a sports academy that I was starting back home in New Zealand between jobs. And I was blogging on there, no one had my SEO, so I was just blogging and no one was reading it, except for whatever I posted on Facebook. Um, so that kind of just... That was just, I enjoyed doing it. I mean, I was shit at writing in the very beginning. Like, I, I, we, I know we've talked about this before in the Nutrition Science Builders podcast. And we, um, like, I only just passed university and school and stuff like that because my writing was so bad. I would literally go through, because I could never meet word counts, and just take my don'ts, can'ts, wouldn'ts, and then turn them into would nots, cannot, do not, just to get some extra words in there. So that's, that's the background of my writing. But obviously, over time, uh, especially through university, as I started writing more scientific style papers, that kind of really helped. And then from there, that's when I, I actually started my sweet arts of fighting in between jobs as well. Coaching is a volatile career. You don't want to get into coaching and professional sport, but obviously in between jobs again, started my sweet arts of fighting and just kind of wrote one article. Um, no SEO in mind, nothing. For some reason that when I came back to that site in 2020 after the pet one, it was, it was bringing in a fair amount of traffic just from one article on one site. And I was like, well, <clears throat> I kind of, have an idea of what to do now. Maybe I should do it in something that I actually care about because I don't care about writing about pets. And I just went all in on the site. It was at a time when COVID hit. So I kind of started the journey in April or May, 2020. I lost my contract. Um, 
with an international team there and then was basically stuck overseas from April, well, from then until December, until December with no contract, no pay, just whatever I was doing online. So I just cranked hard on that site, writing, building it, <clears throat> all that kind of stuff. And it's, it's paid off now a couple of years later. Wow. And, you know, when you, what, what kept you going? Like, just, did you have to do it? And you were like, ah, this is the only route. Cause like COVID was going on. You didn't have an active contract. Like you were kind of just on your own. So did you have any other like motivation? Well, at some point, I think if, if there are any kind of coaches or even strength conditioning coaches listening, at some point you just get sick of the bullshit in the industry. Like there's so much shit that goes on, shit pay, shit people, all that kind of stuff. And I got to a point where I was like, okay, I, need, I need to be, I don't, I don't even know what spurred it or keep me going, but I, I just enjoyed it because I think as coaches as well, you're, you're an educator. So being able to educate online, write down my stuff and, and know, hey, I could make money from doing this. And then it also becomes competitive as well as you start ranking in Google and outranking other people. And then it starts becoming a competitive game too. But I guess you could say it was a combination of enjoying it, building, like really building my own thing. I've always enjoyed doing that. And then necessity at the same time. I was still interviewing for jobs through that year and the following year. Um, did, man, didn't manage to get any of those, which is a blessing in disguise. And then I, then I think after I got rejected from one of my interviews was mid twenty. 21 i was just like fuck it i'm just i'm just doing this like i know it because i was always starting to make um some all right i guess you could say all right part-time money on it <clears throat> and i was like i know i can build this and this thing and obviously so when i started hosting the truth i built this podcast that was some extra money as well i was still freelancing doing some writing so that was an, another uh, revenue stream and now i'm hosting another podcast with jackie chow on indexy it's another revenue stream and I'm hosting my own podcast too for my own site, yeah. which isn't a revenue stream, but it's a good thing for the business. It's probably actually been the best thing I've done for the business, um, to be honest. Um, and then it's just kind of grown from there. Gotcha. <clears throat> and I, I think um, one critical piece that I do try to encourage people, and I, I think more people are talking about it, is just like, you should be interested in the topic area that you're writing about. Otherwise, yeah. it's just going to suck. Like you can have some initial motivation, but at some point it's going to be a grind and you may as well enjoy it. So how critical was it? And it sounds like all your sites are pretty much related to something that you're pretty passionate about. So how important is that? That's been everything because I don't, I don't need to sit down for some of the topics or for actually for a lot of topics. I don't need to sit down and do hours of research to figure out what the hell I'm going to write. I either, know from previous whatever it is or from experience or whatever and then i can write about it <clears throat> it also means that if i want to dive into a topic that i don't know as much about i'm happy to do it because it's learning for me as a coach anyway which helps me do better with you know whatever athletes and things like that and then i get to write about it and then writing about it helps me synthesize all those thoughts into one succinct i guess you could say it ends up being like literature review to be honest um some of the articles have like multiple multiple references on them and it just helps make things in my brain stick whereas if for example on the pet site i don't know shit about rabbits and so i'd have to go and research every like whatever topic i'd have to go and do all the research first and then write about it, you know things like that and that's pain in the ass in the end got it okay so let's get into some of the nuts and bolts as far as like keyword research um how did you approach it i mean since you were part of the, the niches general, except the rabbit one, the pet one. Um, yeah. How did, how did you go about finding keywords? Just through Google. I just, I think I just did it there and through using some of the tools, um, Atrius, SCM rush, when Atrius had their $1 or $7 trial or whatever it was, just jump on that. Um, just pulled out. I can't remember how I did it back then, but I think I must, I think I went through the Google auto suggest, uh, method as well. Now, when I do the keyword research, I literally just put competitors into, one of the tools and I just take all the keywords that I can find and go through as many competitors as I can. That's pretty much how I do it now. So, so for the site that I just acquired, that's what I just did. Cause I, it's in the same similar space. So I kind of know all the competitors or most of them, or I just search some informational keyword and find them. And I just throw them in and I just pull out as many as I can. Um, and that's pretty much as far as I go with keyword research, but for my, for my main site, I don't actually 
I don't go and write all of them. In fact, I probably would leave the majority of them off the site just because. So my site is, it's about physical preparation for the sport. So there are some stuff that's not exactly physical preparation, but if I can make it relevant enough or have internal links to pages that I want to, then I write it. But there's topics that I don't want to write about and there's topics I don't want on the site. So for example, like, you know, how much do UFC ring girls make as, as, as a keyword? But I don't want to, I don't want that shit on my site. Like for me, it says me no value because I don't have to display ads and I'm not going to link it anywhere. And, it's, and the person coming to my site for that keyword isn't going to convert on anything. So I'm not going to bother with keywords like that. So it's, it's more of a, uh, I guess, a, choo, a pick and choosy strategy for that site versus other sites where you can go and just spam with them. Got it. Okay. And how much content are on the sites right now? And we could focus on like the, the two main ones, I guess. That makes yeah. sense, right? Two main ones, they have, oh, it's like 260. I have actually similar post counts now, like 260-ish posts. Yeah. Okay. Eight, on both, each. Yeah. Did you write most of the content on those? Then? Oh, I got the dog barking in the background. Um, yeah, I wrote, I wrote 90, and it's not, wrote 90 plus percent of the content uh, for the site. I still write. I have a, a couple of writers now that, or a few writers now that help out. And then I have some coaches that I've kind of brought on board to share their expertise. Um, and I have them write some posts, but yeah, not 90 plus percent of it's mine. I'm still writing. I'm still writing for both sites and yeah, that's how I'm doing. How did you improve your writing? So you mentioned before that you weren't a strong mm. writer, you've done 90%. So you must've gotten better. So what, what yeah. tips do you have for people that don't have a writing background, but want to improve? You, man, I just wrote, I just wrote blog posts and that the funny thing, I think it was actually writing scientific like journal articles and stuff, that is what eventually got me to writing better. I don't know how and I don't know why. <clears throat> um, I just did. And then obviously just blogging. Like I was obviously blogging quite a bit, even though I wasn't for SEO at the time. And that helped too. So, I mean, that's all I did. I just wrote. And eventually I think things start to fall into place. It gets easier. <laughs> did you... Did you do anything specific? For example, did you focus more on editing or did you go back and read things that you previously wrote to see how good they were? So like, did you do anything conscious? No. No. <laughs> no. I mean, I, if you go back to some old ones, I, I'll read them and be like, yeah, that's pretty average. But other than that, yeah, no, I just kept plugging away and eventually things start to start to fall into place and I don't know if I picked anything up from anywhere. I just, I just know I just kept writing. Okay. And that said, did you, have you gone back to some of your early writing to go and improve it, knowing that you have improved your output? Yeah, for sure. I mean, a lot of the stuff, so I, I try to update my content. It depends on the post, but a lot of my content is easily updated because it might be based on a topic that is relatively, I guess you could say high, highly researched, at least within the scientific community. So I mean, it's like when new papers come out, I can reference those new papers in the article, so it's an easy way to update it. Um, so I'll go back and and update it or when I have the time and I'm not writing new content, then I'll do that. Or if some or if specific paper gets published within that topic, then I know, hey, I'll download that now and go through it and then see how I can incorporate that into whatever it is. So yeah. Okay. Very good. Any other like content tips that you picked up along the way, whether it's like formatting or you know mm. doing research or anything like that? Mm. So I, I think the biggest value of, at least from the income school from when I started was the, the post, at least the introduction and the answer paragraph in the beginning. I think most people are doing that now anyway, trying to take the snippet where you have the introduction, answer paragraph, directly answering whatever it is, and then the, the short uh, lead in. But I've made sure to keep the introductions like, mega short i'm talking like one or two sentences intro one or two sentences answer paragraph one or two sentences short lead and that's it i'll i'll get straight into the article from there makes it a lot easier it doesn't fill it with fluff i make sure my writers do the same thing and just keep it really tight there that's been the biggest thing <clears throat> with content and then i guess the other thing is i write a lot from experience and opinion as well within the content so it's not just regurgitating maybe what what else is set out there? It'll be my, in my experience, 
I prefer, in my opinion, et cetera, et cetera. And even if I'm referencing some research, so for example, um, some research I'll, I'll write about and I'll be like, okay, they found these results, um, but these studies found something different. This could be why this kind of, this kind of stuff. So going a little deeper in terms of interpretation and providing a bit more of my point of view versus um, something stock standard. Nice. Okay. So one thing I want to get into is the different monetization methods that you have. So a lot of times, you know, very easy to get it started with like Amazon affiliate, easy to put display ads on your site. You have gone a step further. So can you talk about your approach to monetization and how it's gone so far? Yeah. So I started with the intention of going down the display at affiliate, I think like most people do it and most people are taught. Um, it was actually Miles Beckler, Matt Giovannici, their, their old talks and streams they did over and over talking about not having display ads and eventually I just went like, nah, <clears throat> like fuck it, I'm just going to do do the affiliate and then do my own products. So I was creating my own digital products or I had created it at that time. And that's just the road I've been down with those sites, not having the ads on there, and it's been it's been great. And I've just been pushing, yeah, affiliate products, and then my own. I started with my own digital products, which were uh, like training programs, courses, pretty much just that. And then that was kind of all the funnel based email marketing and things like that too. And then just recently, I guess in the past month, month and a half, I have now decided to make that a subscription based. Uh, I guess membership where you kind of get access to everything for a monthly price plus a private community. And I did that because the one of products can be volatile. So like depending on the month, it would, it would range quite heavily. And I was like, oh, I just don't know if I want to keep going down that road of just trying to build something. And I don't know how much is going to come in that month. And it could be so volatile, like some months less, some months more. So at least if I have the membership, I can also look to provide more value through, say, a community. I can update, add more programs, courses, uh, all that kind of stuff, and it just makes it a little easier, um, at least for me, to be able to to monetize the site in a way where at least I know what's coming in. Got it. And yeah, I was going to ask about the specific products and like, was it hard to develop them? Was it video? Was it text-based? Can you elaborate more on some of the early products before you move to this subscription model? Mm -hmm. So the products are actually the, the same, but they're just kind of together. But so first one was like training programs. I did, they were either PDFs or Google Sheets. Um, and they were sold as like individual training programs. And then at online courses, I literally uh, just had it on Thrivecart, on ThriveLearn. Mm -hmm. And then everything was through Thrivecart and ThriveLearn. And then... I had that, uh, basically that was all I just hosted on YouTube, unlisted, and then just had those videos on there because I'm, I'm a cheap ass and don't want to pay for all sorts of stuff. So I did that and that was kind of like my bootstrapped way. And then before I, before I was actually going to do the subscription for everything, I, I launched a, a community as its own subscription separately. So I was going to do, okay, I'm going to have a community membership kind of thing. You pay for that, that's a private thing. But the programs and course and stuff are all going to be separate. You do those and you buy them one off on your own. And then when I did that, I, I launched on the same model on both my sites and it was it flopped hard. Like I maybe made a few sales, maybe if that. And I was like, shit, this community thing is a wash. It's damn hard. Like people generally, I guess, don't want to pay to be just in a community because what's the real value when there's a lot of free communities out there? So then I was like, okay, I pivoted um, not too long later and the preparation of Black Friday. And I was like, okay, I'll put everything on. So I have a friend who sold this app company to someone who we put me in touch with. And essentially they uh, allow you to white label the app and it's like a training app. So you can put all your training programs in the app. Um, so it protects everything. You can put your courses in there if you want. Uh, and they just take a rev share of what's happening. So you're not paying a subscription. And I was like, okay, so I think in a few weeks, moved everything over to launch for Black Friday and then just put everything together. And I was like, okay, one one fee, you get all the training programs, you get all the courses and you get access to the private community. And that did so, so much better doing that. 
versus just having the community. So, and then I'm just kind of with the community, just I'm trying to make it where the community makes the bulk of the money, um, just so I'm in control of everything. Obviously, we know with affiliate programs, you never know what's what's going to happen with commissions and et cetera, et cetera. So uh, that's kind of the big goal of, of this year. And I'm expanding out and doing a lot. I started, I actually started this week, when this comes out a month ago, um, on a lot of social and YouTube back on YouTube as well and growing the podcast, information YouTubers, all that stuff to kind of bring in more traffic from outside of just Google and kind of build more trust and all that kind of stuff too. But we can dive into that if you want. Sure. Before we do, did you have um, an email list? And if so, how big was it yeah. for the like the launches and your oh. first um, you know, sales of your own products? When I, I can't remember how big it was when I first launched the products. It wasn't that. In fact wasn't that big. It must be only a few hundred. Now it's like at 2,500-ish that it grows. It's not huge, but um, get good open rates. I get like 30 to 40% open rates, depending. Sometimes a little lower, um, depending on the, on the topic, but around that range on, on both sites. <clears throat> so I get pretty high, pretty high open rates on those, which is nice. I'm just trying to figure out the balance between what I'm sharing over email marketing versus what's going in the community. So trying to make it like, you know, if I'm writing something to the community and I send out an email list, and it's kind of like everyone's got the same yeah. value, I guess. Um, but the, the big the big value about the community is I've pulled in a whole lot of coaches from my podcast that I've met and then I'm, that I've known before into the community um, to basically be in there to help community members, whatever. So I've got like um, the Great Britain Boxing SNC, and I've got guys who are working with pro boxers in Scotland, guys working with the Ju- National Judo Dutch Olympic team, all that kind of stuff in there who are some have created programs, some created courses, some have not created anything, and they're in there to chat. I mean, just, <clears throat> we just chat about stuff and live calls and whatever else. And getting the hang of doing the community thing, I think I've got to a point now where it's kind of s- slowly getting to a point where it's sustaining, but, man, communities are, aren't easy. <laughs> no. Yeah, I was gonna say, I mean, I'm not I'm not a participant in communities. Like I'm part of some some communities and I'm like, I just don't use whatever mechanism they have. Like I just don't give a shit. Yeah. Whether it's Discord or Facebook groups yeah. or like some other like dedicated platform, like I just don't care to do the work to be part of the community. So you're and, my worst nightmare as a customer then. Yeah. 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 Cause I mean, like, I, like I just, I mean, there's other aspects for the communities that I'm in, but like, it's, I don't get much out of them. I, I think it's like what you put into it, but I'm not putting in really anything. So I'm not getting anything out of it. And I know some people love them and like they spend a lot of time in there, but like for me, it just doesn't work. And I, I don't have communities. I, I know some of my friends have huge Facebook groups and stuff like that, or like, they get something out of it, which is great. I just know my own personality. So are you a participant as a um, community member in other places? Like, is it something that you find naturally like enjoyable? Yes and no. It kind of just, just depends. Yeah. I I don't know. Just, I like the, I like the idea the way I did it was you don't have to be part of the community because you get everything else anyway. So I kind of made it as like the community is the bonus. <clears throat> you know, if you want to be in it, you can be in it. If you don't want to be in it, that's fine. You can just do the programs, courses, whatever, and you can be left alone. So that's kind of how, how I structured it in a way. And I think, you know, the ideal situation is like, you know, you get it running and then the community like runs itself. Like that's the dream yeah. where like people have conversations and they like do it on their own. You don't need to be there anymore, but easier said than done but like that's the mm. idea right yeah i mean i think it's, if you have a huge a huge following and stuff and you get like boatloads of people in there instantly i think then you've it's pretty much there and it, i might have launched it too early in my website's life cycle but i launched it early anyway because i was like fuck it i'll put in the sweat equity to make it work <clears throat> like i don't give a shit even if it's not going to be thousands of members initially like mm. whatever the people who are in there who want to be in there they trust what I do. They like what I do. They find value in it. So I'll do it anyway. And then it can just grow slowly from there and I'll just keep making, keep posting in there and keep doing all that kind of stuff. So I was just like, I'm I'm happy to put in the work to make it work, even though I'm probably not going to get thousands in there like instantly. How many people are in there now? 
I'm not sure in the community, but I've got, uh, I don't know how many active subscribers I have now. It was up to like 70 at some point. Might be down to like 50-ish, and then, and then on the other side, it might be like 20-ish. So not huge, but it is growing with people coming in every other day or so. Okay, cool. And what do you charge monthly? 27 a month and 270 for the year. Okay. And the, the, pla the plan was always to be able to charge 37 and then potentially 47 or 49. So that'll be the end goal, but <clears throat> I know I need to provide a lot more value to be able to increase that price. And one way I'm, I'm looking to do that is to have uh, instructional videos. So if anyone's in the martial arts space, instructional videos are fucking huge. Like there's a site called BJJ Fanatics and they do millions. And all they do is they, they basically film a technique series with various famous uh, athletes and coaches. And then they sell those instructionals for hundreds of dollars. And they just, I think they rev share it with their, with the athletes and coaches on like a 60, 40. And that does super well. And I was thinking, and I know there's a few other ones that have popped up that are more subscription based. And I was thinking, well, if I can add that to the membership too, so it's all encompassing, does your physical prep. And it also gives you the tip, uh, instructional kind of stuff. That's where I think I can start to really start to put the price up <clears throat> and really have that value. Um, and, and the other way is just offering more stuff from the other coaches. Obviously, it's somewhat difficult to always have coaches involved because they, you know, they have their own jobs. They're working in with the athletes and stuff like that. So to expect them to always be in there doing stuff isn't always possible. But I try and encourage them as much as possible and, and try to get them to, uh, I guess, create something of value for, for the membership, like a program, course, whatever, and then I rev share with them. Um, what are they doing? So essentially, the model is I bring people in, both sides to do this. I have coaches, I have them create maybe a program, course, whatever it is. I have the landing page, all that stuff up that has their link, their referral links on it. And then I give them the keyword topics to write about on the blog. And I don't pay them to write for the blog. I pay them in commissions from the people that bring into the blog that might convert to their program or course. And that's how I've done it. And it's probably more easier in my space was coaches are used to doing so much shit for free. It's like a, it's like the curse of a coach. Um, right. But, okay. but the idea is that they can build up, uh, I guess, recurring revenue from their link, from people that bring in through their articles to their programs, et cetera. Okay. Got it. And that, that makes sense. I mean, it, it's a, a bigger, package than what they would be able to provide. And so it's kind of a win-win. I mean, I see the value from mm -hmm. both yeah. parties, like, and you understand as mm -hmm. a previous coach or current coach, kind of like, Blame. you, you <laughs> know how they had to deal with, like you said, creating content for free. And now you're like, yeah. here's the value. Like, here's what you can do with it. Like you can earn money from it. Like you potentially, you get something out of the effort versus like just giving the content away for free. Yeah. And coaches, most coaches have a super shit in business. I know I was super shit. Like I didn't give a shit. All I wanted to do was, was work in pro sports. So even, I still remember at the very beginning, I was thinking like, I don't give a shit about the money. I just want to coach. <clears throat> I'll coach for whatever it is. And eventually you get to a point where you're like, okay, that doesn't quite, that doesn't quite work anymore. And so there's a lot of coaches that either just don't have the time, don't have the time to learn. And then just don't really want to invest in that kind of stuff. So I've already got the platform. So it makes it a little easier to be like, hey, because that's part of the, part one of the reasons I've always wanted to do something like this, this as well, because I'm sure any, most people listening who maybe are interested in fitness and they go on Instagram and they see whatever's on there and it's just fucking dog shit, everything's shit, just dumb motherfuckers <laughs> everywhere doing the dumbest shit, millions of followers selling shit programs, just doing shit everything. And then you got guys like guys I've had on my podcast and in the community PhD researchers leading the field and whatever they're doing within various sports and various topics, um, working with some of the top guys, but no one knows who they are just because even if they're on social, still no one knows who they are because they're not doing what these dumbasses are doing on Instagram. So that's kind of one of the reasons I wanted to create this is this brand can get big enough. Then these coaches come up with me and then whatever they do, I come up with them too. So it's kind of like a reciprocal thing. Got it. 
Before we switch gears to like YouTube and podcasts where you're trying to like open mm. that funnel up a little bit, what mistakes have you made? I think there's probably a few and you could pick from, you know, current stuff, early stuff. <laughs> I know I've made a lot of mistakes, but yeah, any big highlights that we can learn from? Well, that membership one I mentioned before was, I guess you could say a mistake, but pivoted from there. Um, shit, what else have I, I don't know. I've probably made heaps of minor ones signing up for bloody, I know we talked about this on, on the YouTube site builders podcast, signing up for yearly and two yearly bloody, um, subscriptions for tools and things like that. I've kind of stopped doing that unless I'm going to use something. I definitely like know I'm going to be using it and I have used it a lot. There's something that that's got me caught now, <laughs> frustratingly. Um, Man, I don't know. I don't know other than that. I might okay. have to come back to that one. Sure. Yeah. If you think of any more, um, I, I can fill in and just say like, ah, recently, you know, it, it, I make, I make mistakes of like starting things and then not finishing them, which is weird. Cause one of my, I think one of my strengths is I can complete things. Like I could do things a hundred percent. It's really easy to like start something and do it 80%. But I have been guilty in the past year of doing some, like I'll start, you know, in air quotes, case studies and I'll do, you know, I intend to work on them for a year and I work on them for six months. And then I'm like, I'm not getting that much out of it. So I'll stop. So mm. I could spin it as a strength where I'm like, if I'm not getting something out of an activity, I'll kill it. Like I ignore the sunk cost yeah. as much as possible. And then I just stop doing it. Um, the, the other side of that, like the negative part is like, I'll start things and I'm just like, you know what? I'm, I'm just not going to finish it. So double-edged sword. I think it's valuable to quit things, you know, then you could focus on other stuff, but okay. If you think of any others, let me know. Let's talk okay. about YouTube and a podcast mm -hmm. and try to open the funnel up and get more people, um, you know, buying the courses and just like getting in into the membership. So what yeah. was your approach and you could take them, you know, together or, you know, one at a time. Yeah. So the podcast was born out of my hatred for filming YouTube videos. So I started, I started the YouTube channel a little over a year, a little over a year ago. I think it was, I've done, I was turning my articles into videos basically. So taking my article topics and then turning them into video talking head, that kind of stuff. So informational style, and I had done about hmm, maybe like 15-ish of them. And then I just stopped because I was like, man, I just cannot be bothered sitting there trying to set up this camera. And like, I had an old GoPro and it just sounded like shit and everything. And I sent it to the editor and I was just like, man, I just can't do this. And then still really push hard in the writing and everything else. And I was like, okay, I'm just going to leave it for now because I can't be bothered with that. And then I'll come back to it. And then I was like, wait, after starting to host the niche website builders podcast i got a real feel for hosting i was like hey maybe i can host my podcast then because i kind of thought about it but never really pulled the trigger just i when something's really that unfamiliar i guess it's a bit more difficult but then once i got kind of used to it there i was like okay maybe i should start hosting my own i got used to the platform that i was on and then i just started and i just started with within my network of coaches that i knew um, professionally brought them on to talk, talk about different topics and then since then it's just been going really well um had it's probably honestly as i mentioned near the beginning of the podcast it's it's been the, probably the best thing that's happened to my business was doing that it's opened my network like exponentially i mean i've brought on a lot of those guys into my business um just from that podcast chat to a lot of them like yeah that's been a that's been a huge game changer changer for me um in terms of that so that's been really good and, and i do that that's like a once a week podcast like most people do how many uh, shows uh, do you have? How many episodes so far? I've got 41 now, I think it is. Okay. So slowly moving through. Gotcha. And so once a week, how, how much prep do you do for episodes? Pretty much none. Okay. <laughs> like, cool. I, I, I mean, even for the niche, hopefully I don't know Mark, I'm listening to this then. If, uh, if, even for the niche website builders podcast, I won't do much prep. Like I'll do maybe for, I'll go through maybe, I guess Twitter stuff and just see kind of what I've been talking about, or if there's any particular topics, but I kind of like it to flow more conversationally. I just ask questions about what's going on and it kind of moves a little bit. I'll have some kind of, I might have some questions down if there's some specific things, but 
yeah, most of the time it's no real, for my podcast, it's no real prep. It's just more, hey, these, I know this is the topics that maybe they're an expert in or things like that. And then just, just run through those. Got it. it. I always find it interesting. I know I have a friend and she does, it, it's a great podcast. It's very dense with information. She does a huge, like she'll prepare six to eight hours, like per episode, sometimes oh more. And it is, you know, hugely time consuming. And I mean, I think her episodes are probably better than whatever you and I produce. However, you know, I don't think she's getting as much value as the effort that she's putting in. So it's like mm. incrementally better, but not that Is it a solo much. podcast or is it guests? Uh, typically guests. Yeah, I think like 90% of the time it's guests. So, I mean, she does have great questions, but one thing I've found in pro probably you too, James, is like there's a handful of questions that you could ask that can be customized to like different scenarios. So yeah. even you could probably use the same style question on the niche website builders and the, you know, combat sports, right? It doesn't seem mm -hmm. like it, but like quick example, mistakes that you've made, like turning points. How you do this and yeah. Like that. So there's yeah. some pretty straightforward and there's probably like eight or 10 of them that you can kind of have in your, your back pocket and you could always like pull them out, customize it to the situation. And then it usually works out. And yeah, very interesting. But I, I do like a casual podcast generally versus like mm -hmm. one that's overly prepared or overly produced. They're different, but yeah. you know, we're not doing like NPR shows here. So <laughs> we, for we sure to edit them. Okay. So cool. Um, anything else with the podcasting? No, no nothing with the podcast. So I do that on YouTube too. So I've, I've kind of dabbled back into the, into the informational YouTube stuff. Um, and uh, I think it's now a little easier because the right, so I've pretty much in my eyes, I've covered most, if not all of the questions that or topics that I want to cover on my site. So my site's getting about a hundred thousand sessions a month and I'm like, okay, I've got that. I've got people coming in for this kind of content. There's not much more I can write except for just updating those articles. Maybe there's one, a few here and there that I can get covered, but for me to further expand, I need to find another way to bring people onto the site. I was trying to go down the paid traffic route as well, but man, that's such a mission to, to really nail down and, and a lot of money to test. And I wasn't willing to do that just yet. So I was like, okay, I'll go back onto the information on YouTube stuff. I've been posting shorts pretty much every day. So I pull the clips from Riverside. I get my wife to edit with the captions and stuff like that. And then post those. I just, so a friend here in Austin, he, kills it within his uh, business. He uses Hype Fury for Twitter. I think most people might be familiar with that. It's like Tweet Hunter or whatever. Just you schedule your tweets and automatically post Instagram, all that stuff. So I've been doing that. I've been doing scheduling two tweets a day and then posting one of my shorts um, onto YouTube and a shorts onto Instagram. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this and just push it. And I know <laughs> the first day I did it, I got a new customer. And I know it was from that because I saw someone liked the post on Facebook that was automatically posted there. And then that name was the one that signed up for the membership. And I was like, okay, there's 100% something there. And stuff getting some good engagement, getting lots of shares from different coaches and athletes and, and whatever else. So it's just going to be one of those games. It's, it's one of those things where that niche does well on social and the trust factor does well. As I mentioned, a lot of, a lot of dumbass coaches are on social media sharing whatever they're sharing and they've got big followings. So... It's something that plus the YouTube is what I'm really looking to push this year, particularly with that side. With the other general more fitness side, that just needs, because it's in that space, it just needs more content. Like I need to get to a thousand posts. Like that's pretty much, <laughs> that's that in a nutshell. So for that one, I'm just like, okay, I'm just focusing on the written side, not worrying about socials. Um, I'm also not worrying about socials and Twitter and YouTube as well because it was an acquired site. So the old dude's face was all over the YouTube and stuff like that. So I'm kind of like, eh. I don't know if I want to have to go in there and try and revive that anyway, or have to do YouTube for that one and YouTube for that one and podcast for those and podcast for that. <laughs> so yeah. that's the other thing. It gets to be a lot. Yeah. So shorts mm -hmm. are interesting. I've, I, I don't, 
I don't love like short form content as a consumer. Like I Neither. try I to stay away know. from it. I mean, it, it does suck you in, but like, it's not a positive thing for me. So I try to limit it. And, you know, with that in mind, I'm like, I don't really want to produce that kind of content. However, I am kind of getting sucked in to <laughs> think about You're on the like, bandwagon now. Yeah. Like maybe do some shorts. And, and the thing is like, I, I like, I like working on the things that I'm working on and I have spent time on YouTube and I'm like, okay, so sh my channel, like the algorithm is shifting. Like YouTube is trying to wrangle us into a certain area and shorts are part of that. And I can see it like clearly with, you know, six years of data, like I can see like things have changed even though I'm doing nothing different. So with that said, any tips for people that are looking to like short form content, specifically YouTube shorts? So what have, what have you learned in your days doing this? Not much, except I'm just repurposing content. I'm just trying to do the least amount of work to get the most amount of content. I remember I was talking to Clint Butler on the Niche Website Builders podcast. I think it was after, after the show. And he, was, he said, man, like if I was in your niche, I'd just be repurposing the content over and over and over again. Because he said, it's interesting as well. Like depending on the, I don't have their style of content yet, but maybe when I have instructionals, but for example, within the jiu-jitsu community, because the sport is just fucking blowing up like crazy over the past few years. <clears throat> Obviously, as combat sports also grows massively too, but there's just this hunger for technique style videos, whatever it is. I don't have that yet, which is which is fine, but, but the niche is so starved for information that I've just been repurposing podcast clips, um, tagging guests in them, then they share it, things like that. Um, and I'm trying to – eventually I want to do the same with my long-form informational stuff. I'm not yet sure how I'm, how I'm going to do it other than maybe refill, trying to refilm something in the portrait mode on the phone and then doing it. But Because obviously when it's on landscape, when you're trying to go short, then you're going to cut most of the stuff out maybe that you want. So I have not mastered that part yet, but right now it's just repurposing as much as possible. Um, okay. So it's less, less total work. Gotcha. Yeah. And I, like I, in theory, right. I'm like, yeah, <clears throat> repurposing makes sense. It, I mean, it does make sense in a lot of ways. However, I know from my analysis in the past and hearing other people talk, like you have to sort of create the native piece of content, like or mm. it's always going to be a little inferior. So just like you said, like if you try to repurpose, it's a different, you know, vertical versus horizontal format, like you're missing something. And if you knew that it needed to be vertical initially, unfortunately you have to reshoot it, but like it will do better because you knew that at the beginning. So like you can repurpose the idea of the content, but it's a little harder to repurpose it. Otherwise, like you're cropped and you run into issues. Mm -hmm. So that is where I'm like, you know what, if I'm going to do it, like I may have to, you know, whatever film on my, my phone directly, or like just do it intentionally to do a better job yeah. versus like, all right, I'm going to try and take the shortcut. Not that I'm not judging you to do that. Cause I'm like trying to figure <laughs> out how, to, how I could do that too. But at the same mm -hmm. time, when I check it out, when I watch stuff, it's like clear when someone intentionally did it and it does better. It's a better experience. And I think in the long run that works better, but any thoughts on that? No, no real question, but any thoughts? Yeah. Well, the, the nice thing about, about Riverside when you film the podcast, you can, you can export and edit in your different formats. So you can export it in the normal landscape YouTube stuff and you have your podcast. Then you can just go cut one minute clips in the vertical and it does it for you. And then I just, then I just make sure my wife, she puts the captions on there because a lot of people don't listen to that stuff with sound. <clears throat> so I make sure the captions are on there and that's pretty much it. Outside of that, I haven't figured out the rest of it. Okay. And then uh, <laughs> does Riverside do the captioning also, or do you have, does she have nah, to manually do it? She uses it on CapCut. CapCut, I think it is. It's a free one. Okay. A free, free editor on, I don't know if it's on Android as well, but it's apparently one of the best across all, what all the Instagram people say. Got you know, it. To do all that stuff. Okay. And I used, um, for, I don't have an active subscription, but I used a uh, Descript for a little while because it mm -hmm. does a, 
auto captioning. Yeah. I mean, it's a video editor transcription thing. It does a lot. It's not particularly cheap. I think it was like 30 or 40 bucks a month or so, but it can do, it can do some very, um, impressive things and it saves a lot of time. One of the things is, you know, you, you can edit video, you have your captions in there and you could export, you know, vertical format and it, it does all the stuff you need to do, but it's, you know, something you have to do. <laughs> do you put, do you post the episodes with the transcriptions on your site? No, no. no. Yeah. yeah. Um, like the full transcript of, yeah. Cause I know some people do that. Like they have their podcast sign, they have episode, blah, blah, blah with blah, and they do the whole transcript. Yeah. Um, so I, I did look at that a little bit and some people were like, yeah, you got to do that. It's great for SEO, which turns out I, yeah, I, I, I don't mileage may vary, but I mean, if someone looked at the transcript of this conversation, it's like nonsense, like tons of filler words, yeah. lots of, it, it, you would have to edit it. And the people that told me like, it's, I really love to have a podcast with a transcript. A hundred percent of this is my own survey. A hundred percent of the <laughs> survey uh, answers were like, they don't listen to the podcast. They don't want to listen to the podcast. They want to read it, which is not my target audience. Like if you don't want to listen to the podcast. I don't know anyone who would want to read a podcast. Yeah. So it's people that don't listen to podcasts. Basically they were like, <laughs> they're like, I hate podcasts. I just want to read it. And like, I've never looked at a transcript or sorry, one time I looked at a transcript cause I knew the episode had the content that I needed. And I was like, I want to, you know, do mm. some further analysis, but I listened to it the first time. So basically I don't do the transcript, but it, it would be valuable. So on, on YouTube, right. People often want to have the closed captioning, you know, it's an international audience and, you know, YouTube does a pretty good job doing the transcription. Yeah. Um, it doesn't always show up automatically, but I think it's, it's often available. So that's yeah, the only thing enough. with transcripts. Um, so anyway, anything else with, uh, the YouTube side? No, that's, that's pretty much it with the YouTube stuff. Okay, cool. And I, I've, uh, exhausted many of the questions i'm trying to think even where we were at because we went down the <laughs> side we road. To social media social media rabbit holes up but I can, I can jump into something else i've been doing as well is uh regarding uh link building stuff so one, one thing i've been doing is actually uh, leveraging my the vendors that i'm affiliated for and using them as my link building strategy essentially <clears throat> so i'm um, okay basically writing guest posts um, for their sites, for their blogs. And then what I'm doing is I'm making them an affiliate for me. <laughs> so Perfect. it's almost like a reciprocal thing. So I'm an affiliate for their products, sell a bunch of their stuff. And then, hey, I'll write, I'll write you some articles. I put links in there to my pages that I want with whatever anchor text I want. And then I also be like, hey, I give them the affiliate links to put in there for <clears throat> the membership as well. So that's, that's something I've been doing. Um, for, with a few different uh, sites as well. And if I can't do that, I'll ask for a link, you know, to whatever page for a different things. So that is maybe a little nugget for someone who's doing well with a, with a vendor that they can look to do. How did you approach them? Most of them approach me. Um, I, yeah, my, I mean, my site's doing relatively well. So I've had a whole bunch of different uh I guess the big well-known ones, at least within within that space, kind of reach out and they want to <clears throat> be featured, do something, whatever. So it's funny enough. So a lot of them, a lot of them. So the main one that I've partnered with now, I actually have co-branded uh, training gear with them. So funny enough, they've been they've been emailing me for ages. I just ignored the shit out of it because, uh, as you know, you know, you get a bunch of different emails and stuff, and I was like, I can't be fucked. They just want links. Um, and then they eventually got in touch with one of my coaches who had done something on me. Then he forwarded it to me or something like that. And I was like, okay, fine. Emailed them and then jumped on a call with the guy. And it was like, the, it was fucking awesome. So we just talked and he's like, yeah, like that, your site's, you know, doing really well, blah, blah, blah. You know, they want to you know, look to collaborate or partner or something. You know, what, what would you want out of like a partnership with him? And I was like, well, the one thing I've always wanted to do was to create a physical product or have my like physical products, training gear, whatever. And he's like, yep, sweet, we can do that. 
it's just straight away, no hesitation. We can do that. Um, send over your stuff and we can put together. So I've got rash guards and shorts now for jiu-jitsu and things like that. Cool. Um, so they did that for me and then I just promote their things. They send me whatever is on their site that I need. And that's been kind of like the main one. The other ones that have reached out, yep, same thing. I've just been like, um, can you send a bunch of gear? So I've got one of my writers is in Bulgaria and he's a, a coach and, and fighter as well. So they're sending thousands of dollars worth of gear out to Bulgaria to have them for reviews and things like that. So that's been been something big too. Just a lot of yeah, a lot of the owners and stuff of various companies. Because funny enough, they so one other company that reached out, the um, they, they went a lot of them go down the influencer route, and they I've talked to a few different companies and they struggle with it big time. Where okay, this YouTuber guy or this whoever it is, athlete, whatever, they have an Instagram following, whatever. They send them stuff, they might do one post or one video, but they might get initial traction that first day it's out and then that's it, nothing. And they might make one or two sales, and, but nothing's ongoing. There's no real brand presence for them. They don't get the continuous eyeballs on their product or sales. And so they found, you know, they reach out or either or I form a collaboration or partnership with these companies. It's like, okay, you've, you've got what they need, which they don't have, which is attention from an audience to come see the stuff. And it's constant, it's consistent. So people are coming to those pages or whatever it is I'm doing um, over time, give it, basically giving them exposure. Um, so they're more than happy to send product, do whatever, and work with me because of that versus, hey, I have 10,000 people on Instagram. Can I get something free and do a post for it? Because they don't even last for how long. And that's, I think that's where the big advantage with a lot of people, if you have a, a site in whatever space, companies are always looking for that because they're finding that the whole – a lot of the influencer stuff just isn't long term for them, or they get burned by it. Um, so yeah, and, and one, one other company I'm now looking to work with, they they went they had that exact same problem. They had a famous, I think it was an MLB player, something like that, and he had millions of followers, and he sold none of them. You know, he was asking for like, I want like thirty five percent commissions. That's what he usually gets. And I'm like, okay, sweet, do something, and you know, nothing came from it. And they just shut down the affiliate program completely because it wasn't working for them. Um, but now they're looking to part at least part like we're looking to partner um, through some mutual people and stuff like that and they'll do they'll reopen that program just so I can promote it with affiliate commissions things like that so that's been really good um, I don't even know what the original question was I'm just kind yeah. of rambling right now no that's perfect <laughs> well that makes uh, perfect sense also when you look at like the website traffic that you would get it's mm. completely different because people are usually Googling something, they're looking for information where social media is like coming at you like a fire hose mm -hmm. and it doesn't have the longevity, even if, you know, there's volatility with um, SEO and your traffic and stuff like that. It's not the same sort of content treadmill that like social media would be. So it makes yeah. total sense. And, you know, it started with link building. You just mentioned, you know, you were able oh, to yeah, yeah. You know, work with vendors and stuff like that. And I've, I've done that in the past also. Like you said, sometimes you reach out to them. Sometimes they reach out to you. But the thing is, like, if you do have a site that's getting traffic and it's pretty, like, a specific niche, like, they'll find you. They know that you're yeah. getting traffic in their, like, demographic and audience. So that's perfect. Yeah, yeah. It's happening more often than not recently. I've had quite a few. It was actually really nice. I had one company reach out. They're like, hey, you, you, in this article, you've got one of our products actually links to Amazon, but we actually have our own affiliate program, so you can make more if you want to link to that. If not, all good. And I was like, oh, shit, you're sweet. So I just think cool. that that's been way better just doing stuff like that. Um, it, it's just funny because I like to work with the – I like to part, essentially partner and collaborate with the people that I'm going to be affiliate for because – one, I, I like the products, and two, it's it's nice as a partner and collaborate versus just being an affiliate. I know like one company's reached out and they've just been difficult about things, and I'm just like, and I already promote them quite a bit on the site, and I'm like thinking now, hmm, maybe there's ways I can look to switch them out, you know, here and there, just yeah. because you know, various things. So yeah, the partnership stuff is is quite nice. Very cool. Well, as we're wrapping up, any other, you know, broad tips or things that you want to talk about that we didn't cover yet for, your, you know, whether it's, um, you know, keyword research or content or monetization or anything like that? Um, I think 
regarding, I guess, having a successful website, having leaning into your point of difference or your leverage or whatever you want to call it. That's kind of what I've done. That's I've jumped into the space that I'm in, that I was in career wise. I studied in, I've published research in the space. So I actually link my Google scholar profile to my website. Like that's as eat as you can get, I guess. Um, <clears throat> so stuff like stuff like that, we can leverage, leverage what you have, like for, and another example, like I write for a bunch of other different, I guess, higher authority sites that, other people can't get links on because they might not write for them. They might not have the experience and background to be able to write on them. Um, and that's kind of given me a unique link building strategy too. And I think it's one of the reasons why my, my sites haven't been so t- uh, volatile, I guess, with the lot of Google updates because I've had a lot of these different links. Um, so, yeah, lean, leaning into that side. Um, <laughs> another thing I'm actually looking to do is – looking to publish more research again and use that as a try use that as a link building strategy because <laughs> well i mean it's it's funny because you can't really link to a blog within a scientific journal but i've seen it and i've had a blog link to my site and the link was so damn powerful it still ranks my site on the second page for that keyword even though that article's not even on that site anymore um <laughs> so, so i'm like maybe i can look to do that and then kind of link back to find a way to link back to my sites when publishing research. So that's something I'll probably look down the road. I'll go down that kind of road too. Very cool. Well, James, this has been awesome. A lot of cool stuff that you're working on, and you know, people can can check out your podcast. Where where should people find you? Because there's a few spots out there and we'll we'll be sure to link up to it in the show yeah. notes and description. But yeah, where should people, you know, find you? Dude, there's too many, too many places now. <laughs> so um Twitter, if you want to follow me. I, my my personal Twitter is at J Delacy01. And then Instagram at J Delacy90. And then you can find me, I host the Niche Website Builders podcast. You can find me over at Niche Website Builders every week. I co-host the Indexy podcast with Jackie Chow. Uh, you'll find that on Indexy on YouTube. And that's every week as well. And that's on the digital marketing side, all that kind of stuff, various guests and things. Um, then if you want to see more, co- if anyone's in combat sports or fitness, wherever it is, come to Sweet Science of Fighting, you'll find that on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. That's pretty much it now. I did do TikTok at one point, but... Yeah, TikTok. I hate TikTok. <laughs> yeah, I deleted it off my phone. So, yeah, cool. <clears throat> awesome. Well, James, we'll, like I said, we'll link up to everything so people can get to it and they can, you know, follow you at the appropriate area. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll catch up soon, man. Really appreciate it. No, cheers, Doug. I appreciate it.